Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good morning my fellow councils. I am Ayman Amali Karim and I am Nusaiba Binti Muhammad Hussein. We have been asked to represent the survivor of a victim of tort who wishes to sue both the tort fiercer and their employer for trespass to person. As partners of this firm, we would like to take up this case especially since our expertise is in vicarious liability. So this is our presentation of our arguments as to why this case is a strong one for our firm. The material facts are as follows. Muhammad Haide was a 23-year-old university student who once went to a mosque to pray but found the door to be locked. So he went to the next door neighbour to inquire and knock on the door. The neighbour thought that Muhammad Haide was a thief so he snuck out of the back door to warn the mosque, uh, the mosque caretaker about the presence of a thief and the mosque then made this warning using the mosque's loudspeaker to warn the neighbourhood. Muhammad Khaide, now hearing activities at the mosque, did not know that the warning was about him. So then he returned to the mosque and walked inside. Fortunately, when Khaide walked into the mosque that day, a mob of angry locals brutally attacked him with sharp objects and blunt objects, believing that he was a thief. They felt so justified with their actions that even one of the locals filmed them a beating uh, Haide mercilessly and he was lying defenselessly on the floor. Most regrettably, Muhammad Haide did not survive the attack. He, the suspected cause of death was the numerous deadly injuries he suffered, including gash wounds from a machete. The victim's family wished to sue the individuals who uh, attacked him, but one of the individuals who were actually uh, the mosque caretaker, so they wished to sue the employer, which is the government of Malaysia. Therefore, the parties to the suit are Muhammad Khaidir, represented by his families as the plaintiffs, and the defendant, the mosque caretaker, the individuals who participate in the attack, and the government of Malaysia. However, since we are focusing on vicarious, vicarious liability, for the purpose of this presentation, we would discuss mostly on the liabilities of the mosque caretaker and the government of Malaysia. In order for us to establish vicarious liability, we must first establish primary liability. For the purpose of our case, we will be bringing two issues for the judge's consideration to establish battery. For the first issue is whether the mobs attack with sharp and blunt objects amounts to battery. And the second issue is whether the individuals within the mob are jointly liable for the attack on Haidim. For the first issue, in order to establish battery, we need to establish the three elements of battery which are hostile intent, direct force, and without lawful justification. For hostile intent, this simply means that the intention is hostile, that is having elements of enmity. The Court of Appeal case of Wilson against Pringle explains this clearly, and in our case, the hostility is evident as the locals believe that Haide was a thief and they had reacted violently. The second element is direct force. Clearly, the plaintiff had been hit with sharp and blunt objects, so direct force is immediately established. And the third element is without lawful justification. To illustrate, compare the case of Dunning against KK Haji Dwaran and Mahmoud against Government of Malaysia. In Dunning against Malaysia, battery is established as the defendant policeman had no grounds whatsoever for believing that the plaintiff had committed offence that justified the shooting. But in the case of Mahmoud against Government of Malaysia, the policeman was patrolling Taman Tasik Tidiwangsa when he heard a lady scream in a secluded area past midnight and immediately after saw two people running out of some bushes. He gave them repeated warnings and even gave a warning shot, but they continued to run, so the policeman shot one of them in the leg. Section 15, subsection 2 of the Criminal Police Code allows the police to use all means necessary in order to effect arrest. Therefore, arrest here is lawful. In our case, there is no evidence that the man is a thief and it definitely does not warrant any act of violence towards him. Therefore, the act has no lawful justification. So the answer to the first issue is yes, the mob's attack with sharp and blunt objects amount to battery. So for the second issue, we will refer to the English High Court case of Brooke against Bull, where Justice Salter stated that the defendant was liable 
On several grounds, including that the person committed the act as an agent of the defendant, the defendant had control over the situation and that the joint act done by defendant and the other person was done in pursuance of a concerted purpose. So in our case, the most caretaker was the one who warned the neighborhood about the safe. And being the caretaker of the mosque and that the locals were waiting inside the mosque, he was clearly one of the leaders of the group. This act also took place in a mosque, a place of which he has control. The acts of Bedri II, though committed by different people and with different objects, are towards one concerted purpose, to punish the safe, and he cannot claim innocence from trespass to person. So on top of that, we will be using the video recording and call upon the other locals participating in the mob attack to give their testimonies in court to further support all three of our grounds. We are confident that we can convince the court of the truth of this matter. We expect the defendants to bring up the following defences. Defence of property, lawful arrest and mistaken identity. However, these defences are weak so we will only address them briefly. First, the defendant may claim that he was defending the mosque from the thief. But since there was more than 10 people available then, it is far more realistic for them and far more reasonable for them to just apprehend the thief, check his belongings and call the police. For the defense of lawful arrest, it will also fail as Section 27 of the Criminal Police Code only allows the mosque caretaker to apprehend him as a private citizen until he can be delivered to the police or until he gives his correct name and address. Section 25 of the code also states that he must deliver the person to the police without unnecessary delay. It is not lawful for the mob to take law into their own hands and attack the supposed suspect. Lastly, in the case of mistaken identity, the court does not accept the defense of mistake of fact as defense in law of tort. In the case of Chatterson against Gerson, the court did not accept the defendant's defense that his operation if on the wrong person was a mistake due to an administrative error. Therefore, we can see that all three defenses will fail. So next, now we will move to the crux of our case. We will advise our client to sue the government of Malaysia, the employer of the mosque caretaker, for being vicariously liable to the tort committed by the mosque caretaker or the nakib. So Section 5 of the Government Proceeding Act 1956 states that in cases of tort, the law shall hold the government liable for any wrongful act done by a public officer while performing his duty. The law would thus view the public officer as an agent of and is acting under the instructions of the government or in other words, the government will be vicariously liable for the tort. Now, Section 2 further explains that officer here means a person in the employment of the government. Therefore, in order to sue the government of Malaysia for vicarious liability, there are two issues that we must raise and answer to the court, whether the mosque caretaker was in the employment of the government of Malaysia and whether the mosque caretaker committed the tort during the course of employment. The first thing we must establish in the case of vicarious liability is the employee-employee relationship. A person will not be vicariously liable if the tort visa is only a contract worker providing his services on contract. Therefore, we need to establish that the mosque caretaker or the nakib was in employment of the government of Malaysia. Usually in cases of vicarious liability, we will establish this relationship based on several tests. The control test investigates whether the employer has certain powers over the tort visa. The organization test looks at the tort thesis post and whether it is an integral part of the employer's organization. The multiple test looks at the overall circumstance and if the situation is the same as an employee-employee relationship. However, our situation is unique because the posting of the Nakit Masjid has been provided for in a statutory provision. So this will take priority in deciding the nature of the relationship. Section 76 of Section 2 of the Administration of Islamic Law, Federal Territories Act 1993 states that the post of Nakit Masjid shall be a post in the general public service of the Federation. And if we refer to the Federal Constitution, Article 132, Clause 1, Paragraph C states that the general public service of the Federation is considered a public service. With these provisions in mind, we can now apply the three tests to this relationship to further support the presence of the employee-employer relationship. First, we will look at the control test. 
This test looks at whether the employer has the power to select the worker, determine salary, control method and instruction of the work and determine and terminate the employee services. Clause 2 of Article 132 of the Federal Constitution gives the government the power to the Yang Dipertuan Agung as well as federal law, the power to regulate the qualifications for appointment and conditions of service of persons in the public service. So this relationship passes the control test. The next test is the organization test where uh, this is the second test that we will look at. So in which the court will look at whether the worker is a part of the employer's organization. In the case of Mat Jusof bin Dawud against Syarikat Jaya Sebarang Taki Sendirian Berhad illustrates this best when it established that the tort fiasa Sowell was an employee of the defendant's sawmill even though he claimed to be working for a third party who was under a contractual agreement to supply workforce to the defendant. This is because sewing is an integral part of the sawmill business. So in our case, Section 76, Subsection 2 of the Administration of Islamic Law, Federal Territories Act 1993 and Article 131, Clause 1 of the Federal Constitution clearly shows that the post of Nakib Masjid falls under the general public service and the public service is an integral part of a functioning government. Therefore, this relationship also passes the organization test. The last test we will apply is the multiple test. For this test, we will look at the overall effect of the relationship to see if the contract is a contract of or a contract for services. A Nakit Masjid's role is to maintain and manage a mosque. Section 79 of the Administration of Islamic Law, Federal Territories Act 1993, shows that the Nakit Masjid has some power and control over the running of the masjid through the management of the performance of duties of the other Pagawai Masjid. However, if we look at Section 74 and Subsection 3 of Section 78, their independence is limited by the federal laws to be subject to Jawi and the secretary, as the secretary of Mawib and the Mawib itself, Majlis Agama Islam Wilayah Persekutuan. Uh, so we can see that ultimately this control does come from the government of Malaysia and he is not working there on contract. Nonetheless, an argument might be made by the defendant that since Section 74 and Section 78 of Section 3 states that Mawib has direct control, Mawib then is actually the employer. However, while Mawib does have some executive powers to manage the Pegawai Masjid's performance of their duties and its supervision, Section 76 of Section 2 of the Administration of Islamic Law, Federal Territories Act 1993 clearly stated that the Nakit Masjid is a post under the public service and as we have discussed earlier, this explicit rule takes priority in determining who the employer is. Hence, much like in the case of Majuso against Sharikat Jaya Zubran Pake, while Mawib has some executive powers based on the statutory provision and the test we've applied earlier, the government of Malaysia is still the employer of the mosque caretaker. Now that we have established that the mosque caretaker is indeed an employee of the government of Malaysia, the next element we need to establish is whether the employee committed the tort during the course of employment. So for the employer to be vicariously liable, the tort has to be done in pursuance of the tort fiasa's duty as an employee. There are two tests that we can apply to establish this. So the first test we will use is the Salmon test. The objective here is to determine whether the wrongful act is an unauthorized act. That is something he was not employed to do or if it is an authorized act done in an unauthorized mode, that is the act falls within the scope of duty. So now let us compare the case of Twine against Beans Express Limited and Rose against Plenty. So in the case of Twine against Bean, a driver gave a lift to an unauthorized passenger. So this act was clearly beyond what he was told to do. Hence, the driver committed an unauthorized act and vicarious liability is not established. So in contrast, in the case of Rose against Plenty, the milkman was not allowed to have children assist his work and he was not allowed to have a passenger. However, the milkman had engaged a 13-year-old to help him in his work. 
who later got injured during an accident. So it is clear here that the milkman committed the tort while he was in the process of performing his job and thus he had carried out his duty in an unauthorized mode. The case of Bohjaraj against Nagarajan is a case where the employer was found vicariously liable for the battery committed by the conductor against one of the plaintiffs. The tension began when some school children refused to move inside the bus and sit down at the conductor's instructions. So the conductor reacted by using vulgar and abusive language. The plaintiff is another passenger who questioned the actions of the conductor, and the conductor then challenged the plaintiff to a fight, which the plaintiff refused. Nonetheless, the conductor punched the plaintiff with a knuckle duster. The judge found that since the defendant's action here uh, fit into the role of maintaining order in the bus, so that the defendant's conduct against the plaintiff was regarded as an improper mode of carrying an authorized act. We can apply the principles of this case directly to ours. The most caretaker's responsibilities include protecting and maintaining the security of the mosque. And it is clear that the caretaker's action to attack someone he thought was a thief was done with the interest of the mosque property. Therefore, the battery was clearly an unauthorized mode of carrying an authorized duty. So this does pass the Tillman test. We can also use the close connection test when discerning if the tort was carried out during the course of the employment. The objective of this test is to see whether the employment was a mode for him to carry out wrongful acts or if it merely created an opportunity to carry out the tort. The employment has to be a mode to carry out a wrongful act for the employer to become vicariously liable. So now let us refer to the English Court of Appeal case of his men's against clarity cleaning for a case in which the employment merely created an opportunity and is not the mode for the tort. And in this case, the cleaner tort piercer was employed to clean and disinfect telephones. However, he used one of the phones to make private long distance calls. So Lord Justice Perkis found that cleaning phone is not a mode of making phone calls. Instead, his access to them created an opportunity to enable him to make the phone calls. Compare this to the English House of Lord case of Lister against Hesley Hall, in which the employment was indeed a mode for the tort visa to carry out the tortious act. The school in this case was held vicariously liable for the sexual abuse that the school warden taught FISA had committed towards the students. Lord Miller illustrated that if sexual abuse was committed by the groundsman or the school porter, then it would only be due to the opportunity that the employment give because it is not their duty to care for the students, to care for the welfare of the students. Conversely, Lord Clyde highlighted the taught FISA's duty as a warden to care for and look after the students. The school's responsibility for the care and welfare of the boys was directly transferred to him through his duty as the school warden. This means that he abused the special position given to him by the school in relation to the school's responsibilities towards the victim. Therefore, the school was found vicariously liable. So if we apply this case of Lister against Hesley Hall to our uh, case, we can show that the government of Malaysia is indeed vicariously liable for the battery committed by the mosque caretaker. This is because the mosque caretaker was entrusted the duty of protecting the property of the mosque. The circumstance of the case clearly shows that the mosque caretaker attacked the victim because he thought the victim was a thief. The attack is therefore clearly an unauthorized mode of carrying, or of carrying out his duty to protect the mosque's property. Hence, the mosque caretaker's employer, the government of Malaysia, is clearly vicariously liable. From our presentation earlier, it is apparent that battery has been established and that the mosque caretaker himself is liable for the battery. And additionally, we have also proven that the government of Malaysia is vicariously liable for the battery committed by the mosque caretaker himself. We have illustrated how the principle found in the case of Mat Joso against Syarikat Jaya Seberang Taki applies where even if a third party has executive control over the selection of employees, the tort fiancer is still an employee of the defendant because the post of the employee falls squarely under the organisation of the defendant. And we can also make a comparison between our case and the case of Boh Jaraj against Nagarajan where the tort fiancer had committed battery against a passenger while he was maintaining order and discipline in the bus, an act which falls in his scope of duty as a bus conductor. 
As such, the employer was found liable. We believe that the judgment of this case would decide categorically who the employer of the Pagawe Masjid would be, as this has not yet been resolved in court. Should the government in Malaysia be found liable, this would promote the government to create better legislation to ensure that the government servants would carry out duties specifically of security um, responsibly without stepping on the rights of others. But most importantly, we must address this very regrettable incident in which a young university student stopped by a mosque, a place of sanctuary, a place of serenity, to perform his religious duty to God, but was instead met with unfounded suspicion, violence, and unfortunately death. This was one occurrence too much, and a severe action against the employer would hopefully stop this case from ever repeating itself. My fellow counsels, we hope that our partnership would accept the plaintiff's request to seek justice for their loss and to ensure that this incident will be the last of its kind. Thank you.